fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I am Al Warren. Co-hosting, of course, today is Mr. David North Martino. Wow, I get all three names today. Yeah, yeah, it's Friday. You got to be. It's got to be polite. It's polite Friday. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're less than a week from the, uh, you know, that uh, Thanksgiving thing. So we got to be polite because there's going to be a lot of not very polite people, of course, with all the traveling. You know how that goes. Yes. Oh yeah, it'll be fun. I st- of course stay home, hidden <laughs> with my dogs, and that's all I need. That's okay. right. Too much going on. <laughs> Well, let's just jump into it today now because we've got a uh, writer here on standby, so let's introduce her and get this going. Now, the new book is called Murder in a Cape Cottage, and it's a cozy caper book group mystery for, say that ten times quick. We've got Maddie Day. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm really glad to meet you and to talk about writing and books. Yeah, it's it's, it's always fun. Um now, now, of course, um, this interests me. Uh, before we get into this book in, in detail a little bit more, um, I've noticed you've also written under uh, Edith Maxwell. So let's let's tie that together because I always find it super fascinating when people write under different names, like a pseudonym, and I, I wonder what the reasoning is or why you chose to do that, or like maybe explain what that's all about. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Edith Maxwell is a name I've always had. You know, my parents gave it to me. And I had several books in a local foods mystery series, Cozy from Kensington, as Edith Maxwell. And um, my agent and I were playing around with the idea of a, no- a new series and came up with the idea for the country store mysteries. And my editor at Kensington wanted it but he wanted me to use a pen name, even though it's exactly the same genre. Like sometimes people use a pen name if they're writing romance and mystery, or if they're writing erotica and they're a school teacher, they want to use a different name. Uh, in this case, it was exactly the same. And my, but my agent said we, he thinks that he thought that it was because the local foods books, while they were selling well, they weren't selling super well. And my editor probably wanted me to look like a new author in the bookstores and the um, Amazon and so forth. So I came up with Maddie Day fairly randomly. Um, and Maddie Day does sell super well. So now I have <laughs> actually three contracts for Cozy Series with uh, Kensington under the name Maddie Day. So we're, we're, keep, wow. we're keeping her around. Yeah. Well, well, maybe the name sounds more cozy. Than, maybe. Yeah. You know, yeah. because I was thinking, because I do all nonfiction and true crime, and I was thinking of having a different name for fiction books that I write. Yeah. So maybe I'll be Madden Day or something. There you go. There you go. Go for it. Go for it. <laughs> you know, or, or maybe, it, maybe it'll work. Or yeah. you could be uh, Warren Allen. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking of different there things. You go. And I was like, well, I've got to. I've got to see what goes on here. Yeah. You know, I, I I think maybe I used my middle name, Robert Allen. There you go. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Right. It's, it's kind of, you know, but, um, well, that's, that's really cool. So how did, how did writing become, um, a, a lifestyle for you, a job? A, a, because you're, you're really into this. You've got a lot of books out. You've been doing this for a while. Um, where did it start? Like, were you were you that kid at school that was writing in, in grade one and and little stories and all that right from the get go, or is this something that came along later? You know, I was writing fiction all the time as a child. I was um, at age nine. I won a um, a short 
a children's short story contest um, at the Pasadena Star News for the Viking Girl, and they paid me two dollars, which was a long time ago. I have silver <laughs> silver hair. Um, it was a big deal. Then I sort of I got into journalism in high school and college. I completely stopped writing fiction for decades, but I I love reading mystery fiction. Um, in the sort of early 90s, I was I started to pick up all these books written by women with female protagonists. So Sarah Paretsky, um, Sue Grafton, um, Catherine Hall Page. And I thought, oh, this is the kind of book I'd like to read. And in these books written by women with female protagonists, I don't have to read about men always sort of referring to women's boobs and legs because the women don't do that. And then when I started writing mystery fiction myself in the mid nineties, I thought that's the kind of book I want to write. Not so much the lady PI like um, Sue Grafton and Sarah Paretsky, right? But the female, the amateur sleuth, the sort of murder she wrote or Miss Marple type of books. So that's what I write because that's what I like to read. How do you get the confidence, but to do that? Um, I always say this to, um, to people that, um, are successful in writing books because you've, you've, you've done this quite well now. So how do you, how do you get the confidence and keep it? Ah, that, I think that's partly, so I have spent my entire adult life writing of one kind or another. Um, I got a doctorate in linguistics. I did all academic writing. My most recent sort of day job was as a technical writer which is procedural. It's like writing recipes, you know, step one, step two, step three. Um, but I also am a fairly optimistic person. I happen to live with um, someone for almost 20 years, whose name is Hugh, who's a fairly pessimistic person. And he had known his former wife had been a, a writer and he said, you know, when I started out, he said, you know, it's really hard to get published. I said, Hugh, somebody's going to get published and it might as well be me. And, you know, it's not an impossible thing. It's hard when you're beginning. You have to study. You have to network. You have to learn your craft. You have to work and work and work. Like when you're learning the piano or learning to cross-country ski you're, you're you're lousy at it when you start but you keep working at it and um my murder in a cape cottage is my 28th published novel traditionally published novel so i've had you know regular publishers for all of those um i just am polishing my 33rd novel right now it's due december 1st so um the confidence i think came partly from within me and also from working really hard to be able to do this job and succeed at it with help from mentors and the New England crime fiction community and all kinds of people. But I think, um, uh, you know, somebody, I knew somebody was going to get published and I wanted it to be me in it. I, I made it be me. Did you uh, kill your competition out or something? No, no. And when I started like going to conferences and networking, I realized how kind and generous and friendly people who kill people fictionally for a living, they're so nice in person and are like really helpful, really mentors in the New England community. Hallie Efron, Hank Philippi Ryan. You know, Lucy Burdett. I mean, these people mentored me as I was coming up. Now I have the opportunity to mentor other people to do manuscript critiques and write blurbs for other people's books. So, no, I didn't kill off anybody because they were so helpful and nice. Well, it's good. It's a good community. Well, in a sense, I guess, really, in writing, the, the water's warm. You can come on in. It, it's not going to hurt having another good writer out there and there's room there's room for all of us there's room for all of us people read people who read and who love mystery fiction they read a lot and they love it and there's always time for another book 
Yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. Um, now, so you, you did mention traditional publishing now, and I went through that and I've, and I still do traditional, but I've also done a few self publishers. Now, what's your thought on self publishing nowadays? You know, there's people who do it really well. They get really expert editing, proofreading, copy editing. Um, for me, um, you know, you, you're really a business owner. I mean, any author, any published author is a business owner. You're self, I'm self-employed. But to self-publish, and I have, I have reissued a number of my sh- formerly published short stories as standalone ebooks. And I've figured out how to do that. And I've gotten a cover and they've already been edited. So they didn't really need that. Um, and then three, four books, the first four books in my, historical mystery series, the Quaker Midwife Mysteries, which are published as Edith Maxwell. They went out of print because the publisher orphaned them, orphaned everybody. Um, And so I reissued those as e-books and print books. I don't, I don't, I want to write the words. I don't want to do the business. I don't want to be a publisher too. So for me, um, having Kensington as my publishing home is fabulous. Like they, they also get my books in every Barnes and Noble in the country the day before release day. They, they do publicity for me to an extent. I'm not Stephen King level yet, but I'm a, I'm a solid mid-list author and they do, they do stuff for me. Um, and it's easily, um, you know, independent bookstores can easily buy my books and stock them. So it's just, a they're doing that that side of the business, publishing, and I'm writing the words, and that's how I like it. Do you, do you like doing signings and uh, meeting fans out on the road? Oh, I love it. And and what a a desert we had for a couple of years there. You know, we're cautiously going back to conferences and having in-person panels. Um, it's still a little bit nervous stuff, you know, to be – meeting crowds of people that you don't know. Um, um, I went to the New England Crime Bank last weekend, and so far I have apparently not brought back COVID, which is great. Um, but it's always a little – It's we're still kind of testing the waters to get back in post-COVID, uh, post, you know, really bad pandemic. Um, so, no, I love – I love – talking to fans, meeting with them. Um, But I also like the silver lining of COVID was everybody, everybody knows how to use Zoom now. And so I was the guest at a book group in Northern California last week, right here from my office in Massachusetts. Um, Avid fans, they'd read the new book. They had lots of questions. They were all wearing cool hats. In addition, so as soon as I saw, I had just borrowed a hat from a friend, like a beautiful sort of 40s era red hat. So I ran over to my uh, sofa and pulled on my hat for the Zoom. So um, there's ways to connect with fans that aren't in person and doesn't endanger anybody's health. And that's fabulous, too. And with libraries and bookstores all over the country. Yeah, no, it's, 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 I, I got COVID my very first outing here just last in September. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so there you go. It just, it's luck of the draw. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I hope you don't have any lingering effects. Uh, I still can't smell or taste. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's in, it's, I'm in my sixth week since I was diagnosed. Oh. So, um, yeah, the symptoms are gone. Like I'm not feeling anything other than I still, I can grind coffee in the morning. Nothing. Oh. Not a thing. Gosh. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know how that's going to um, end or how it get, if it gets better. I've heard different stories, yeah. but, you know, how that is. Yeah. Who knows? Well, I hope that right. clears up for you soon. Yeah. Yeah. It would make eating fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's right now. It's not. Uh, um, uh, you know, well, what can you do? You know, it could have been worse. It, so I, I'm fine. Good. Well, yeah. you know, I, I'm this book I'm polishing. It's the first book in my C.C. Barton Mysteries, which take place in wine country, Northern California. And it's due December 1st, and I'm putting the final polishes on it. But I have a character who has anosmia, and that's a hereditary, or hereditary, or at least a, a lifelong 
condition where people can't smell anything. And I learned about that. And I went, oh, I need to put that in a book. <laughs> um, so it's not from COVID, but this guy has never been able to smell. And, you know, my well, yeah. protagonist that's is bad. going, that's terrible. You can't taste food. You can't anything. Yeah, yeah, because you can't. Yeah, it's just texture. Yeah, you, you get nothing from it. You know, if someone cooks a steak, which I'm not really a meat eater, but if you cook it or bacon, there's no smell to it. Oh, so gosh. it's complete texture. So a bowl of cereal to a piece of toast is other than the the texture of it. There's no difference. Wow. Well, yeah, I I made so. it part of the plot of the book of murder uncorked. So. Well, there you go. I see. Right. Yeah, I see. You're writing about me. There you go. <laughs> so how does that work for you how does how does maddie get into the uh mind of her main character or characters like where where does it begin do you begin with an idea a thought an event that's going to happen and then you find a character or do you have a character that you already have established or kind of someone in your mind that you decide to put into a situation um so when i'm starting a new series that's when i invent my main character my protagonist um after that every book i already know her and i pretty much know the cast of oh three or four characters who are going to recur who are her support staff or the local police detective um and that that varies per series. And then, of course, with every new book, there's a new victim, a new villain, and some suspects. The suspects might be new to that book, or they might have been like peripheral characters in a previous one. And I think, oh, I could use that person. They could be. And if I don't need to reuse them, maybe they'll be the bad guy. Um, but for the first book in the series, that's when I really do world building. Um, so my current series now are the country store mysteries with Robbie Jordan, um, who owns a country store breakfast and lunch restaurant in a fictional town in Southern Indiana. I have the cozy capers book group mysteries that the new book murder in a Cape cottage is the fourth in Mac Almeida is a bike shop owner. She owns a, a uh, retail repair and rental bike shop um, on Cape, in a fictional town on Cape Cod, which is flat and has all these former rail trails, so it's great for biking and walking. And then the new series, C.C. Barton, is a um, 42-year-old widow who manages a wine bar, and her twin sister, Allie, runs a B&B in town, and, um, and, and uh, C.C. is a moved only moved to that the town you know, like six months before the series starts so so for each series that that varies um in terms of each book it that changes that really depends on the book sometimes i i hear about a new murder weapon like a great new poison that i hadn't heard about oh i, I want to kill somebody with that okay let's see who should i kill and who might some plausible suspects be or sometimes um, I think of a, the character I want to kill off. Like maybe this is somebody that everybody despises. Or maybe it's somebody really nice and everybody was who could possibly kill this person. So that, that really just changes up with each book. I can't predict what's going to spark the idea. Maybe it's a news story. Um, or like this, Enosmia actually belongs to the victim in the new book. Murder Uncorked, and um, I read about it. I read a, somebody was writing about it. I think somebody who had had COVID I was talking about um, hearing about this syndrome, anosmia, where people can't ever smell in their entire life, and the the mayhem that could ensue. Um, oh, hmm, what could you do, uh, you know, bad in fiction um, to somebody who can't smell? It changes. How do you keep track of all of this? In your series, do you have, you know, a series of tools? Do you have techniques? How do you keep track of everything in the book? That's a great question. And, you know, the Country Store Mysteries, the 11th book, 
four leaf cleaver will be out in January. That's the 11th book. And I've written, I've already turned in the 12th book. And like, I need to keep very careful records. I don't read when I'm writing book nine, what color the police cruisers I decided were in book two. So, um, I use software called Scrivener and it's, it's a package that was actually written by a novelist who is also a software engineer, a software engineer who's writing a novel. Um, and it's, it's amazing. It's all in one place. I have my writing screen. I've got like scene cards, notes, you know, it's like a shortcut little, like a note card for each scene. I've got a list of all the scenes and then I've got as if folders, except they're all in one place, uh, for my research and for my character list. And that, I start the character list at book one in a series, and I carry it over to each subsequent book in the series. So every time I learn something new about my protagonist or about the town or about the police department or about any new character or recurring character, I add it. I just I jump out of my text box and I go over to my characters list and I add it. So when I'm on when I'm writing book eleven, I can go back and say, oh that's right, the cruisers are black and their uniforms are black and gray, the police department. <laughs> okay. Or oh, in book two, Robbie was carrying a turquoise cross bag. She I wonder what happened to that. She hasn't carried it in five <laughs> books. Maybe she gave it to Goodwill. You know, I um or maybe she finds a new one because the other one I worn out. So, so I keep as close of records as I can. I still sometimes have to go back to, um, the file of the, of the book before and look for something. If I didn't, if I forgot to add somebody's name or something, their, what kind of car they drive. But, um, I really, that's so important for long running series. And now, like with the CC Barton books, it's the beginning of a series, and I'm being very careful to start off right and keep all those records. Yeah, I use Scrivener, too. I find it very helpful. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and there's all kinds of bells and whistles it has that I don't use. But um, I've found yeah, tons. I've found my the bells and whistles I want to use, and I just ignore all the rest of them. Because there are beginning writers who say, oh, Scrivener is too complicated. It could be complicated, but you don't have to use it in a complicated way. How do you know when an idea is good? Like for you, like how do you know that the book is going to be good when you're, when you're putting it together? Is there times where you kind of start something and then go, no, this isn't going to work? On the book level, I, uh, hmm, you know, I'm, I, I owe my editor three books a year these days. Well, for years I have. And, um, once I conceive of a book and start it, I, I can't back out. I have to make it, I have to make it good. If it doesn't seem good, then I have to figure out how to make it good. Um, I also write short stories, two or three a year. And in the last few years, I've been, I decided to level up and aim higher. And I've had two stories published in Alfred Hitchcock Mystery Magazine and two in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, which are the top two top two publications for short stories. And for short stories, sometimes I'll get an idea for a story. I'll go for my midday walk and the story will like write itself in my head and I'm frantically dictating a, an email to myself so I don't forget. And those are the ones I know are going to be good when they, they just tell themselves to me. <laughs> you know, uh, it sounds weird, but it happens. On the book level, um, it's more that I have to, I just have to make it good because I, I don't have time. I don't take a whole year to write a book or two years like some authors do. I don't, I've, I've committed and I'm, and I like my schedule. I like having those deadlines and, and being busy with my writing because it, uh, when I'm living in the book, it goes better. If I'm not like needed to travel or, you know, I mean, life does interrupt. There's holidays. There's my son is getting married in February, which is fabulous. But, you know, I'm going to be not working for a couple of weeks. Um, but I really like when I can just like dive in. I have unscheduled days. All I have to do is work. And 
and I can really, really uh, live live the story, if that makes sense. So, uh, but I I just have to make it make it work, and I so far so far my mojo is holding. <laughs> I'm making it work, yeah. Well, do you consider yourself a natural short story writer or more of a natural novelist? Do you, do you have a, a preference? You know, I don't, I wouldn't say that. If, I mean, I, don't, hmm. I enjoy both formats. Let me say it that way. I really enjoy them. And, and writing a short story, it's short. <laughs> I don't have to spend four months <laughs> on it, right? I can do it in a couple of weeks or depending on the story. Um, so that's kind of a palette cleanser for me. If I've finished a first draft, I'm trying to let it sit for a couple of weeks. I'll say, oh, there's that deadline for the VoucherCon anthology coming up. Let's see what I can do with that. And so I'll then focus on a short story. Or I get an idea for one and I'll just carve out some time. So I don't know if I'm a natural of either. Um, so far, both have been selling and and I enjoy writing them both, so I'm going to keep going. Now, each one of these books in your series, of course, would stand alone, if I'm if I'm correct, right? I do my best to make that so, yes. Well, it's probably best to get them and, and read them through in order so you can pick up on the characters, right, mm-hmm. and learn about them and that. Do, do, so yeah. under underneath um, all of this, the, the entertainment and, and the, the mystery of the story, do you, do you kind of have... Um, a meaning or a subtext that you hope people pick up from each book? Um, most of my books have, well, some of my books have a more sort of clear theme than others. In all of them, including in my historical series, relationships are so important. So they're really, the plot, each one of them has a plot. They're traditional murder mysteries, so they're puzzles. But the characters and their relationships um, are really important. And all of my series have strong family ties of different kinds. So maybe it's, and sometimes family can be loosely to like the, the small cohort of close friends that my protagonist works with. And sometimes it's blood family. Sometimes there's an additional, there was, let's see, um, in Murder at the Lobster Shack, which is book three in the Cozy Capers, there's a, an encampment of people without homes, of homeless people in the park. And there's a discussion of it at the New England town meeting that the town has. And there's the, the free food kitchen, the free food grocery and the free food dinners that my protagonist, Max's father, who's the minister of the Unitarian Church, that he hosts in his church basement. So there's a kind of a sub sort of theme in that particular book, and different books have different themes like that. In my fourth Quaker midwife mystery, Charity's Burden, uh, which won the Agatha Award for Best Historical Novel, Bravo. <laughs> that was so exciting. It was really, really exciting uh, in 2020. So there wasn't an in-person award ceremony or anything, but we did that two years later. Um, I wanted to look into um, contraception and abortion in the 19th century. And I found I did my research. I read a couple of books. And that's sort of a theme for that book. Turning the Tide is the third book. It takes place during presidential election week, and there's a women's suffrage theme. So these books are set in the late 1880s. So sometimes there's a more clear theme underlying the, the mystery plot, and sometimes it's it's whatever's going on in the village and the characters and their relationships. Yeah, yeah. Well, these char- the characters are so important to you. How do you experience your characters? Are you and and how do you describe them? I guess would be a good um, good question. So, are you seeing them like a movie in your head? Voices? Do you um, do you consider them like family and friends, or are you completely something different than that? I wouldn't say a movie so much, but definitely. I, I'm very intimate with them. I know them, especially the continuing characters, right? Um, my protagonist uh, in the country store mysteries, Robbie Jordan, her aunt um, Adele lives in town and 
Robbie was a, an only child and her mother dies before the series begins. She does, she does discover her father, who she never knew even his name. And he lives in Italy. He's an Italian professor. And so that sometimes he comes to visit and stuff. But anyway, the characters are very real to me when I'm writing a book in that series. But I wouldn't say a movie so much. I, I sometimes wish I could post a picture of one of my characters, like on Facebook. And then I go, oh, they're fictional. <laughs> You're never going to find their picture unless I draw it. And I'm not an artist. So, uh, um, but yeah, so they're that real that I go, oh, I should post a, oh, no, 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 you can't post a picture. No picture on Instagram or something. No, I can find maybe a person who might kind of look like them, but I wouldn't have rights to those pictures. Yeah. Can you hear them? Do you have an inner monologue? Is, is that how you create dialogue or do you have another method? I don't know how I create dialogue, but I have been complimented on my dialogue, which is great. I don't, I don't feel like I hear them except uh, a couple of my, of uh, the Indiana series, the country store mysteries characters. So I was a graduate student in linguistics in southern Indiana, in the next county over at Indiana University for five years, um, a few a few decades ago. And there were some characters, some local people. There was one guy who had totally local, who had retired from, um, I think, the Army, you know, after 20 years. So he was only 40. And he was taking undergraduate courses in linguistics. And he, I still remember how he talked. And I try to reproduce that in my police detective and in uh, in an Aunt Adele, Robbie's Aunt Adele. Um, also, I have a sister who lives north of Indianapolis, and she'll funnel me sometimes interesting dialect things that people say that I put in the books. I make, I think I make the characters in that series, the locals sound a, a little more southern than they are, but southern Indiana can be kind of more Kentucky than Indiana. So I don't think I'm too far off. Wow. How do you do, do you have a, an issue or a problem or or I should just say, how do you get into the heads of a character that are your suspects, your evil, your bad guys in, in these books? Mm -hmm. Like um, because you have to kind of get into them somewhat to write them realistically. Yeah, that's that's a good question. What I usually try to do, that's really the the issue, isn't yeah. it? You know, we all. All of us say, oh, I could have killed him for that. But we don't mean that we could have, that we would have killed them for that. You just, you're upset with this person. So what is it that makes humans cross that, unless they're psychopaths, which I don't deal in, what makes humans cross that line to actually kill that person? Whether, whether carefully plotted out ahead of time or in a fit of passion. What I do try to do is try to find that bit of humanity in the bad guy yes this person like is abrasive and alienates everybody oh and they also grow flowers in their garden they cut them and bring them to the nursing home because everybody has something positive about them i think um possibly <laughs> except sort of the psychopaths <laughs> Not the, not the charming, <laughs> like totally evil people, but almost everybody else, or they volunteer at the, at the cat rescue. Um, so I do try to kind of find that in that person and also just try to understand what was that, what pushed them that far? Was it something in their past? Is it just inability to deal with rage? What is it that makes them cross that line? Right, yeah. right. I would, I would imagine too, because of the style of like cozy capers and, and the, even the cover of your book, uh, Murder in a Cape Cottage, um, location must be important. And you, do you write the location as a character as well? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, people say that I don't, you know, it's, it is important. Um, whether Southern Indiana, it's important. Cape Cod has its own personality and light and tourist business. And I've had just the greatest time designing this um, new C.C. Barton series in Northern California. And I 
I spent a week in my uncle's vacation home in the Alexander Valley last month doing final bits of research and soaking up how the fog rises and what's blooming and how dry is it and, and visiting wineries, which is a great <laughs> art. Yeah. Right? Um, so, but yeah, the setting, the setting's really important. And I always do my best to capture the weather and the birds and the feel and the air and the, all that, all that about the setting. How do you think... How, how do you think when you complete yeah. a book, when you when you put it out like this, how how do you think it changes you, or what does it do for you? Well, by now I have built up, I would say, a really healthy, decent, hearty in numbers community of readers and fans. And I don't just flog my books all the time. You know, I share things about my personal life. I've got a, a big newsletter, subscribership, and people are as excited about the new book as I am. And that's just really fun. It's like throwing a party. Hey, everybody, let's come to celebrate this new book. And sometimes I throw like a Facebook party or when I can, an in-person launch party, but that's very localized. That's just really exciting. And then it's exciting. It's just delightful to hear from readers and read those reviews and say, oh, I couldn't wait for this new book. And it's completely the best one so far in the series and you know i mean uh, of course i still get the occasional negative review but we just don't need to go there everybody does or people who misinterpret the book (laughs) and like what you gave it one star because you didn't like the cover i didn't do the cover you know that kind of thing so it's just it's just exciting to delightful to share a, a new release with new readers and then you know the readers who are the avid longtime fans they'll tell people they'll share it in their book group they'll share it in their church book club they'll um you know send it to their sister so that's the news is always there's always more readers to find and that's great too how, how do you keep it fresh uh, like, how do you keep it um, so that it's still worthwhile for you to keep writing and at the same time readers to keep reading when you're doing so many books? Like, how, how does it how does it keep going and going well like this? Well, that's a challenge in these long running series. Um, there are always new stories to tell. There's always new murder weapons to discover. And I must say, I have not yet in 33 books killed someone with a gun because that's just too easy. I mean, you know, and I don't know anything about guns and I don't want to. So we just I just don't do that. So I much prefer a good poison or a sharpened knitting needle or a garroting or something that's um, unusual. Um, but I with most of the books. So most authors will tell you that 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 muddle in the middle, we all get bogged down in it. And we all think, no one is, I'm never going to finish this book. It's going to be crap. No one's ever going to want to read it. And then once you've written enough books, you go, just keep going. You can fix it later. Um, But I do worry that I'm going to lose my mojo, that I won't be able to write a book in four months and write and polish. so far, it's holding, and I'm always coming up with new ideas. I have this, like, from those early days when I was writing fiction, I have a a lifelong either gift or plague of a hyperactive imagination. So I really, people say, oh, I could never write fiction. Where do you get your ideas? And I just go, I don't know. <laughs> Something also always pops up. Uh, so I don't, you know, but I, I also make sure, I'm sorry, to get back to your original question, that I that my characters change and grow, particularly my protagonist. Um, Robbie Jordan took many, many books to finally marry the man she'd been seeing. And uh, there will be some news in the next book, which is nice. I'm not going to spoil it in Murder in a, in a Four Leaf Cleaver. And so, and in A Murder in a Cape Cottage, at the end of the book, Mac marries Tim, who she's been going out with for the whole series. And that's only book four. But so there's always room for change in um, 
in my protagonist's life. And I, that's important. I do not want my characters to become stagnant. Right. Yeah. It's important. You know, the growth keeps yeah. people coming. Um, now let's, let's talk about you. Now, how do you like to uh, interact with, with readers and, and fans and stuff? Do you have a website? Do you do blogs? Um, what's, what's your, uh, what's your thing going on? Oh, I, I, um, well, I'm a little bit of a Facebook addict. I must confess. I absolutely love it. Um, but interacting with fans there, um, I am one of six uh, New England or former New England authors at the Wicked Authors, wickedauthors.com, a group blog, and we're there every weekday. And on Wednesdays, we have Wicked Wednesday. So Wicked is in New England, an intensifier, like that's Wicked Awesome. Um um, so that's a, I hope, I hope readers will come and find us at wickedauthors.com. I'm also one of 12 bloggers at Mystery Lovers Kitchen. And we are all, we all write sort of foodie mysteries. Um, so two of my series have recipes at the back. So I'm at mysteryloverskitchen.com on the second and fourth Fridays. And the first Sunday of the month, we have around the kitchen table where we all sit and chat about one topic. Um, so I hope uh, readers will find me there too. I I often, very often, run giveaways um, with in accompanying with my posts on on that site. And I'm kind of around on Twitter as long as it lasts, and um, and kind of on a basic level on on Instagram, but I don't too much. I must confess, I have not gotten onto TikTok, Book Talk. I don't really plan to, but we have to pick and choose our social media, you know, outreaches. Um, I would love for readers to find me at my website at edithmaxwell.com and sign up for my occasional newsletter once, maybe twice a month at most. And sometimes there's special offerings just for newsletter subscribers. And you get sometimes personal news. You'll get a picture of my, you know, my son and his fiance or my other son and his wife or my what I'm my, the heart tomatoes I harvested that week and um, so I hope people would would um, be interested in getting my newsletter too. Well, fantastic! Of course, we're going to have all of that up on our website so people can find you cool. with one click easily. You know, it's it's important in that. Uh, yeah. Now, if if, yeah. if someone had never heard of you before, um, what what would you tell them to read? What one book or what series would you tell them to go to to kind of get the uh, feel of who of who you are? Wow. Um, I, in terms of my Maddie Day books, probably either um, any book in the Country Store Mysteries or any book in the Cozy Capers Book Group Mysteries. You know, as of right now, the first C.C. Barton book, Murder Uncorked, won't be out till next fall. So won't be out to fall of 2023. Um, and as I, as you mentioned, as I said, I do my best to write any of these books so you can pick them up mid-series. If you want to start at the start of the series, the first country story mystery is Flipped for Murder. And that shows you it's opening day at, at Pans and Pancakes, the country store. Um, and um, Murder on Cape Cod is the first Cozy Capers book group mystery. Um, so if you want to start at the start, you can find that, but that's all on my website too. Wow. That's fantastic. How was the pandemic for you for, for writing and stuff? Does it, did it really interfere or did it help? Oh my gosh. I know author friends who said they just couldn't write. And for me, Oh, I, what else was there? Like I went outside in the fresh air for my walk every day. Otherwise it was complete respite. It was an escape. I came, my routine didn't change. I came upstairs, my 30 second commute upstairs to my office. I closed the door and, and I wrote books. Like I, I wrote books where I could control what happened. I could control the bad things and the good things and the world outside, messy, scary. It's still kind of messy and scary out there, even though we're getting outside more. Um, so for me, it was actually, I was more productive during lockdown and, and the worst part of the pandemic. 
for which I am completely grateful because I, I didn't miss any deadlines. In fact, I wrote more than usual. I wrote an extra. I have a new historical we're trying to shop. And um, so for me, it was another silver lining. Wow. Yeah. Well, what kind of, or do you have that structure where you could, you can actually just turn it on and write? I mean, I know that, you know, you're under contract at times and you have to do deadlines, but um, are you that type of person that you just, you have to go to the room and work nine to five or, and you can just turn it on when you need to, or uh, does emotional things sort of bother you? Like, you know, for instance, the pandemic and all the weird stuff going on outside and there's struggles and stuff. When it's stressful like that, that doesn't interfere at all. You can just sit down and, oh, I've got to write. It's 10 o'clock, you know? Well, there are times when I'm distracted for sure, but I'm an early riser, so I am always writing by seven in the morning, East Coast time. Um, I don't write all day unless I take myself away on a solo writing retreat, but most days, um, six days a week, I'm here at my desk at seven, but before, for like by six, usually I need about an hour of internet and email and checking blogs and different things. Um, but by seven, I actually check in with a group on Facebook um, that my late friend and editor, Ramona De Felice Long, started years ago on her Facebook page. And we all, it was a sprint thread, and we all checked in on Ramona's page and said, I'm here, here's what I'm working on. And, and you write, a sprint is writing uninterrupted for an hour. Um, sadly, very sadly, Ramona died two years ago. Um, and, but a friend of hers took over before she died. They set up a, a Facebook group, Ramona's Sprint Club. So we, we all, we still all check in and we sometimes think about Ramona. And, um, so I, that starts my day in the best of ways, my work day. Um, so I do these hours, hour periods of doing nothing but writing till about, for me, till about 11, uh, go for my, walk if I'm writing first draft is my plotting walk and I talk out loud to myself about what needs to happen because I'm not an outliner. I'm a I write by the seat of my pants. And then I have lunch and I do other sort of author business in the afternoons. Um two times a year in the off season I go down to Cape Cod and I rent a little cottage and I just write like a maniac. I write morning, afternoon and night. I can write oh almost half a book in a week if I do that. Um, but most days, I mean, I have, you know, I have a life partner, I have a cat, I have a newspaper, two newspapers to read, I have dinners to cook, I have a garden in the summer, so I don't usually write, uh, after the morning, um, on, on regular days at home. Yeah, yeah. Busy, busy. Well, busy, busy. busy. <laughs> well, someone's got to do it, right? You know, someone's got to do it. it. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, what is it you hope your readers take away from your books? I hope they take away a really good story they can lose in. And I, I am pretty sure they're not going to feel worse about the world when they're done reading it because that's my goal. I don't write noir or scary, scary thrillers for a reason. Um, I don't, I want my readers to feel, to feel good about life as a, as I said, life is scary and messy out there. And so I I just want to provide them a really good story they can lose themselves in and that they can feel like they're almost with family, with their own community when they get to know these my recurring characters. Well, fantastic. Well it's been a yeah. it's been a great time. We've uh we could talk forever, but thank you so much for inviting me. It's been really a joy to talk with with you, Alan, and with Dave, and um, yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, waving hi to all your yeah. listeners. Yeah, and now, now, and the newest book we were talking about is uh, "Murder in a Cape Cottage," and it's a cozy capers book group four mystery group mystery four. Yes, and our guest has uh, been Maddie Day. So, thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Maddie. You've been listening to the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Yeah. 
Good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.